And the proper spiritual life begins with a complete change in a person's relationship between God and the sinner. And it's not just a change where God, as the judge, declares you righteous. Certainly he does that, but it's beyond that. It's also a change in experience. You have a different experience with God now. It's a, a change that affects your entire being. Your entire outlook is changed when that relationship is restored. So salvation is not just a change in your standing before God. It's also a change in your experience how you experience God, how you experience emotionally that relationship that comes as a result of being back in connection with God again. Look at the example of the prodigal son. We taught a less message on that back in the first part of January. When that prodigal son was restored back to the father, he was not just restored in terms of position. He didn't just was not just placed back in position of son again. He was also had a new relationship or renewed relationship with his father. That relationship was restored as well. The father greets him and hugs him and brings him back into the fold again. And he's back in the father's house, existing back in relationship again with the father. So that relationship was restored. And that's a great picture of what happened to you when you got saved. You were restored back to where God wanted you, put back in relationship with God again. The balance was restored. The harmony was back. Now, when we talk about this matter of relationships, Understand, and I know you know this, but we need to start here. God is a starting point in those relationships. God is a starting point. And beyond that, God is the fixed point in those relationships. God is the fixed point. And by that I mean everything begins with God. Everything must be compared to God. Uh, God revealed himself to Moses. And what did he say to Moses? How did he describe himself? I am. I am. The fixed point. I am all there is that's needed. I am in existence. That's what God said. And the result of that, the response to that, if you want a relationship with God, is thou art. God says, I am. I says, you are. I say, you are. Everyone and everything is measured from that point, that point of I am. I can liken this to a sailor out in the sea. A sailor's trying to find his way to where he wants to go. He finds a fixed point. Uh, the North Star, the Sun, some fixed point he can hook his, his compass on, and he can direct his way to where he wants to go. He does not fix himself to another boat on the ocean because that boat's moving as well, it's not a fixed point. And therefore, if that sailor wants to get where he wants to go, he finds that fixed point and sets his bearings on that fixed point. It's the same way with us. Uh, if you want to get your bearings morally, if you want to get your bearings in relationship, you find a fixed point. I'm sorry, I don't look to you for that. You don't look to me for that. I look to God for that. God is my fixed point. Everything comes from there. The relationship starts with Him. And I know I am right, when I stand in right position with Him. And I know I am wrong when I stand in any position that contradicts Him. A God is the fixed point. I look to Him for everything that I want to do, every place that I want to start. You know, we often seek to, seek to get God to adjust Himself to us. And I'm guilty of that sometimes. I oftentimes try to get God to adjust Himself to me. I get an idea, I get a way to go, and I want God to conform Himself to what I want Him to do. And that's not the way to go. God, again, is the fixed point. I have trouble in my Christian life when I try to get God to adjust to my plans. When I'm willing to make God my fixed point and adjust my life to Him. Rather than conform myself to His image, I want God to conform Himself to my image. I try to get God to give in a little bit. I try to get God to indulge my flesh a little bit. I try to get God to give mercy to me to do the things that I want to do. That is not treating God as the fixed point. That's treating myself as the fixed point. We need to settle on the fact that that's never going to work. I'm working on that. I'm making, I'm making headway on that. We need to fix the, the idea that God is the fixed point. It will never work for me to try to get myself to adjust, get God rather, to adjust himself to me. I can only get a good start and maintain a proper approach when I accept God for who he is and love him for what he is and make him the fixed point in my life. And if I do that, I, and if I keep the flesh from interrupting that, I will find the peace and the joy and the fulfillment that God wants me to have that I will not find in any other approach but that approach. So, we start with God. In terms of relationships, in terms of harmony, we start with God. And we begin with the understanding that God is everything, and before everything else, God is. He is first in any way we wish to define that. He has been given all things, all things are for His pleasure, all things exist as a result of Him and exist for Him. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. 
And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing, and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I say, a blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne under the Lamb forever and ever. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Father, we thank you for the privilege you give us to open up this perfect book that you allowed us to have, this perfectly preserved word that you've given us this morning. And Father, I pray you might open our hearts and our minds what you have here for us this day. Father, help us to see that life will never be right until we're in harmony, complete harmony with you. Father, show us through your word this morning how to do that. Open our eyes we may behold wondrous things out of thy law, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can see here, all of heaven says, glory and honor and power to him. That's where life begins, and that's where life ends, and that's where all of eternity exists. It exists by giving power and glory and honor and blessing to him. So if I understand who he is, and if I understand what he is, and if I give full consideration to him, and if I then consider what I am and who I am, I realize there's only relationship with God if I'm willing to recognize him as complete Lord of my life. If we completely and fully submit ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And to think that I could have a relationship with him in any other way is to reduce who he truly is and exalt who I am. I've got to recognize him for who he is. Unless a relationship starts with him, and only with him, it starts with me. And if it starts with me, there's no fixed point. And that is not a relationship that could be sustained. It might go along for a while. It can't go along indefinitely. So this idea of pursuing God we've been involved in for the past eight weeks is the idea of entering into a full relationship with him. Complete relationship with God. And to enter into that relationship will require that I put whatever work necessary into bringing my personality into complete conformity with him. And when I speak in this context, let me make clear again, I'm not speaking of this judicial act God did at the moment of your salvation when he declared you righteous. That's a done deal. You are righteous before him. God will always see you that way. I, his, he conformed my standing to him the day I got saved. That confirmation, that, that confirmation occurred the day I trusted him as Savior. What I'm talking about here is conforming to him practically on a daily basis. I'm speaking of conforming to him as I voluntarily exalt him to his proper place over me. I'm talking about surrendering everything we have and everything we are to him and placing myself in complete submission to him in this act of heartfelt worship toward him because of who he is and what he is. He deserves that position. I've got to recognize that. I've got to believe that. I've got to live that way. And when I do that, in recognition of the fact that it's the only choice that makes sense, it is then that this sinful creature is able to enter into a relationship with the Creator. The only way it can happen is when I recognize Him for who He is and what He is. And if I do that, if I choose to recognize who He is and submit myself to His Lordship, Realize at that moment, folks, you begin to swim upstream with the entire world, against the entire world. And unfortunately, you will begin to swim upstream against even some Christians, some other believers. Because you see, folks, as far as the rest of the world goes, and as far as many Christians go, they are out of step with what God wants them to be doing. God wants them to recognize Him as complete Lord, exalt Him there. And if you do that... You're going against the modern thought of the day, and unfortunately, you're going against the practice of many other believers that you may rub shoulders with. I must adjust my ways to his ways, and when I do that, I get myself out of step with the world, out of step with many in the church. When I make that choice, I begin to see things from an entirely different viewpoint. I begin to think in a different way. I begin to live my life with a power and a strength that I never knew before, and it is completely foreign to anybody who hasn't made that choice. Anybody who has put something else on the throne besides Jesus Christ. And my break with the world and my break with many other believers will be the direct result of the change in my relationship to God as I exalt him to where he belongs. Uh, the world does not honor God. You're aware of that, aren't you? <laughs> the world does not honor God. They have no desire whatsoever to honor him. Turn your TV on for 10 minutes and you'll get that picture. You don't even have to watch the show. Just watch the commercials <laughs> and you'll see how little they honor God in the world. Now, some of the world may claim to know him, or they may claim to even follow him, but it's easy to identify what kind of relationship they have with him. 
The best way to determine somebody's relationship with God is simply ask them who or what is first place in their lives. And you will define that relationship immediately by the answer to that question. Ask them if they had to make a choice between God and money, or a choice between God and excelling in their careers, or a choice between God and self, or a choice between God and some other human relationship, which one would they choose? What gets put on the throne? And for those who don't recognize God for who he is, he will be second place every time. And you see that lived out in the world around you every day. The proof is who they make first in their lives on a practical level, not who they say is first place, but rather who is first place in a practical way. Who do they live, how do they live, and who, as they live, who is placed on the throne of their life. The, per the choices that a person makes daily reveal who it is that's on the throne, and the choices a person makes daily is, reveals what kind of relationship they have with God, or if they even have a relationship with Him. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. Joy and peace and fulfillment and victory are found in three simple words. Be thou exalted. There is joy there, there is peace there, there is fulfillment there, there is victory in those three words. Be thou exalted. It solves all of life's problems when I exalt Jesus Christ. At least it addresses them in a way where I can be at peace with whatever occurs. Because you see, folks, that little phrase, be thou exalted, simplifies all of life. When I make that statement, when I believe that statement, when I act on a practical level on that statement, life is no longer complicated by what I want and by what I desire. I am no longer involved in the determining which direction my life takes. When I exalt Him in all things, He directs my ways, not me. I am now just coasting along, allowing Him to set the course. And if I maintain that attitude, it's a course that I will stay on through the rest of my days. And the Christian life is placed on automatic pilot, if you would, with those three simple words, Be thou exalted. And if as I sail through life, some gale force wind comes along and blows me off course. He is there to direct me back onto the path I was on. His spirit has the freedom to work inside me. His work will always lead me exactly where God the Father wants me to be led. Every problem that arises will come face to face with the Father, and no problem can stand against the Father's will. Be thou exalted. Be thou exalted. Now, I'll tell you, and I know you know this, the flesh will fight you on that. The flesh will resist that, uh, that decision. Because, you see, the flesh wants to convince you that you have something to lose by doing this. The flesh wants to convince you that if you exalt Jesus Christ and recognize Him on the throne of your life, the flesh will tell you that there's something to be lost by that. You'll become less in that approach. You'll lose control of your life. You'll not be the person you could be if you didn't make that choice. But let me tell you, folks, nothing could be farther from the truth. Nothing could be farther from the truth. There is no loss in the choice of be thou exalted. There is nothing but gain in that choice. This choice causes man to rise and to conform himself to the image of the Creator. This choice recognizes God in His rightful place and places us in right relationship with Him. We are restoring back to God that which was taken from Him when man sinned. By those three simple words, everything changes. And life is put back into harmony as I exalt Him. And as I exalt Him... God exalts me by having fellowship with me, by communing with me, by involving himself completely and fully in my life. There is no loss in that, folks. There is simply no loss in exalting Jesus Christ to his rightful place. Regardless of how my flesh, regardless of how the devil might try to convince me otherwise, there simply is no loss in that. Man finds his highest honor in exalting Jesus Christ. His highest honor is found in that choice. And so, if I feel reluctant to make that choice, if I question if it's possible that it's the right thing to do, I'm not sure how I could question that, but if my flesh gets me to, to think in that way, uh, there's a verse that I believe will answer that concern for you. Go to John chapter 8 if you would. John chapter 8. If I question if this is the right choice to make, if I wonder if maybe there should be uh, some th further thought given to it, let me, look, let me have you look at John chapter 8, and Jesus Christ will answer those concerns for you. John chapter 8 and verse 34, Jesus answered them saying, here he what he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Now look what he says there. He says when you sin, you place yourself under the bondage of sin. You now be allow sin to become your master. Now, we all sin. We know that. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 tells us that. So we are all the servants of sin by nature. But here's the greater implication of what Jesus Christ is saying here. 
What Christ is saying here is, you're going to serve somebody or something. You're going to serve something the entire life. Every person born onto this earth is born serving something. And I have a choice as to who or what I'm going to serve. Now, sinful man has a hard time seeing that. A sinful man wants to believe that they're free by not allowing God to take control of their lives, not putting themselves under his control. They believe they free themselves by doing that, when in fact they don't free themselves at all. They are not, serviced, they, they are not free from, from that choice. Rather, they place themselves under bondage in that choice. They just allow themselves to become servant to sin instead of servant to Jesus Christ. They place themselves under the bondage of the sin that rules inside them. The person that chooses to rec recognize Jesus Christ as Lord really does nothing more than exchange masters. I got a master who loves me and cares about me as opposed to a master who wants to destroy me. That's the only difference that is made. I simply exchange masters. We trade the cruel master of sin for the kind, gentle master, Jesus Christ. And so sinful man sees himself as free, but they actually have placed themselves under the cruelest master ever. This master who cares nothing about them, for, the, for about their welfare, only wants his sinful desires met, and will take them on whatever road they need to go on to have those needs met. Placing myself under the rule of Jesus Christ places me on, into a yoke that is easy and on, under a burden that is light. It's an entirely different choice with an entirely different outcome if I make that choice. And let me tell you something else. Again, I probably, you probably know this already. I want to remind you of something this morning. From the very point of creation, we were made to be under the reign of God. That's how God made us. God made us to be under His control, to be under His reign. We were designed in His image, made under His control. To recognize Him as Lord is not the unusual choice to make. It is actually the choice that fits exactly how God made us. And by the way, I'm talking about recognizing Him as Lord. I'm not talking about making him Lord, because he is Lord. He's already Lord. The idea is recognizing him in the position that he already holds. I have no ability to make him Lord. He is Lord over all things. That happened the day he came onto this earth. He became Lord of this earth the day he showed up. And prior to that, in eternity, he was still Lord. He's always been Lord. I need to recognize him in that place. That's my choice. That's the choice that I need to make if I want to be in harmony with him. So you see, folks, I was created to be the habitation of God. That's how God made you. God made you to be the habitation of Him. I was made for God Himself to dwell inside me. We're going to talk more about that at 10.30 this morning. I was designed in His image. I was designed to be under His control. And when I make the choice to recognize Him as Lord, I place myself back into alignment that existed when God made me. Uh, my heart becomes His home when God is recognized as the Lord that He is. Uh, that choice reconciles me back to where I belong, and everything else lines up as it should when I start with the fixed point, making Jesus Christ, recognizing Jesus Christ as Lord of my life. So you see, folks, it is not a strange choice to make. It is the only choice that makes sense. Nothing else restores order to my life like recognizing Jesus Christ on the throne of my life. And so when life seems out of joint, when it seems like life isn't working out, when it seems like life doesn't make sense and things don't fit together like they should, the first thing I need to check is who's on the throne? Who's on the throne? Who do I recognize as Lord of my life? And when God is on the throne, when God is exalted, everything fits into place exactly as it should. Now, with that in mind, go to 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2, you might know, is the story about Eli and his sons. Eli was a priest in Israel. He had two sons who were also priests as well. And here is God talking to Eli, one of his priests, and I want you to see what he says in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 30. Here's what the Bible says. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, these are God's words speaking now, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Now I want you to look right in the middle of that verse one more time. He says, Be it far from me. And then he says this, For them that honor me, I will honor. You're aware of the law of gravity? You are aware of the law of gravity, obviously because you're sitting here this morning, you're not floating off into space. You know the law of gravity exists. Did you know you cannot break that law? 
There's no way to break the law of gravity in, in your human form. Now, I realize airplanes and so forth break that law, but you in your human form can't break that law. There are certain laws, again, in this universe that exist that are unbreakable. Uh, the laws of aerodynamics that allow airplanes to fly, those laws cannot be broken. There's a law I just read to you. That law is un as unbreakable as any law that exists in creation today. God says, them that honor me, I will honor. It's a law. God has said it. It's an unbreakable law. God says, if you honor me, I will honor you. And that law stands, and that law has always stood. And Jesus Christ said in John 12, 26, If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there also shall my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my Father honor. Jesus Christ took that Old Testament law and brought it into the New Testament. Both Testaments are covered by that law. If you honor God, he will honor you. God in that law defines how he's going to relate with his creation. In that law, God tells you how to have relational unity with him. Again, not unity in position, that's settled at Calvary. But rather unity in practice. How can I be at one with God in a practical way as I live this life? And the story that surrounds that verse that I just read to you in 1 Samuel chapter 2, as you read that story, you're going to see that law in reverse. You're going to see the second half of that law, them that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Now, that law existed the day Eli's sons were placed into the priesthood. If they would honor God, he would honor them. However, Eli's sons failed to honor God. Uh, they used the priesthood as a way to benefit themselves. You know the story. And so God sends Samuel to those two men and to the nation of Israel and announces the consequences of the failure that they have of not honoring God. Now, Eli chose to be unaware of the law. God gave him the law there in 1 Samuel, Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30. God gave him that law, but... Uh, Eli chose to not recognize it, chose not to operate by that law. That law was working behind the scenes all along. He was also unaware, although he should have been aware, he was unaware or chose not to be aware of the judgment that was going to fall because these priests had chosen to benefit themselves instead of honor God. And so God sends the Samuel again to tell them about this. What happens? Well, Hophni and Phinehas, the two priests, Eli's sons, who refused to honor God, both die in battle. Hophni's wife, wife dies in childbirth. Israel flees before her enemies in battle. The Ark of the Covenant is captured by the Philistines and carried off. Eli hears of the news of the Ark being taken, and he falls backward in his chair and breaks his neck. All those things happened because they chose to ignore the law of 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30. When you refuse to honor God, judgment comes instead of honor. If you honor him, you get honor. If you choose not to honor him, judgment is the result instead. Now think about this. Think about the men of the Bible that you know who honored God. Think about men like Noah and Moses or David or Daniel or Elijah and many, many other I could, I could talk to you about this morning. All those men sinned. Every one of those men has their sins chronicled in, the in, in their lives in the Word of God. And yet, in spite of that sin, they honored God. They recognized who He was. They recognized their own sin. They had a genuine sorrow for that sin. And what do we see? We see God forgiving that sin. We see God overlooking their failures. We don't see permanent judgment falling upon any of them. Now, they paid for the sin that they created, obviously, but the permanent judgment of God, like what happened to Eli and Phinehas and Hophni, that was not shown to these men. Why is that? Because they honored God. They honored God, and God kept his law. If you'll honor me, I will honor you. God poured out his blessings upon those men. God showed his limitless grace to those men. Honor God, and he'll honor you. And he'll honor you in spite of your sin. He'll honor you in spite of your flaws. He'll honor you in spite of the mistakes you made. That's the law that God has given us. The true man or woman of God who sets their heart to exalt God and chooses to exalt Him above everything else in this world or outside of this world is honored by God. God accepts that intention and God honors that intention and God responds according to the law that He has set for us in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30. And even when we fail, God honors the motive of our hearts. God honors our intention. God honors our desires. And God blesses us based upon those intentions and those desires. You say, well, how can I live this law out? In fact, give me a picture. How does it look to live a life like we're talking about here? How does it look to live a life where God is always exalted, where God is always recognized on the throne? We have no better example than the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He is the perfect example of what we're talking about here this morning. Because Jesus Christ in his humanity walked on this earth in complete submission to the Father and gave all glory to the Father no matter what he did. Jesus Christ never sought his own glory. He always sought rather to direct glory to the Father who sent him. Go back to John, if you would, chapter 8. John chapter 8. And look what Jesus Christ says here as he talks about his relationship to the Father, as he talks about who's on his throne, who he recognizes as, as on the throne of his life. John chapter 8, look at verse 54. It says here, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honors me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep his saying. Jesus Christ says there, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. He's honoring the Father instead. Now you see, the Pharisees couldn't comprehend that. That's who he's talking to here in this passage. He's talking to these Pharisees who are questioning what he's doing. And as he says that, these Pharisees can't comprehend it. And the reason they couldn't comprehend it was because they had wandered so far from the law that we mentioned back there in 1 Samuel chapter 2, they couldn't understand how somebody could honor God at their own expense. They couldn't understand how somebody could honor God and set their wishes and their needs and their desires aside and just honor the Father. They couldn't get it. They didn't understand it. They lost track of the law. Look back at verse 49 of that same chapter. Jesus answered, if I have not a devil, but I honor my Father, and ye do dishonor me. Now look at that. The very reason the Pharisees dishonored Jesus Christ was because he honored the Father. They couldn't get a hold of that. They couldn't understand that. Uh, his willingness to honor God without reservation was the very thing that caused them to dishonor Him altogether. And the Lord said something else about His desire to honor God and their desire of the lack to do the same. Look at verse uh, chapter 5. Go back a few pages if you would. Chapter 5. I want you to see what Jesus Christ says here in John chapter 5, verse 44. A fascinating statement and also kind of a disturbing statement that He says here. Uh, John 5, 44, How can you believe which honor one, an one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Now look at what he says there. He says, How can you believe which honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? What he is implying here is that if a person desires on honor among men, it makes belief in Jesus Christ impossible. Look again, he says, how can you believe? You're not honoring the Father, you're honoring yourselves, you're honoring each other, and because you're honoring each other, you can't believe. You can't believe. It seems possible that all the intellectual reasons that a person gives for not being able to believe in God are nothing more than a smokescreen. They have a whole different issue, actually. The real root of why a person can't honor God and won't believe in God is because they choose to honor each other and honor themselves instead. The real root of unbelief, the real reason a person chooses to be an atheist, is due to their greed to be honored by others, a need that cannot be met if they honor him at their own expense. So man chooses not to believe in God because they want the honor. And man internally realizes, because he was made that way in the garden, man internally realizes, if I honor God, I can't honor myself, and nobody can honor me if I'm honoring him. So I won't believe in him, I'll reject him, and that way I get the honor. Now, it's going to be a sad day when they wind up in hell and realize that was all worthless, it was all for nothing, but that's not where they're at. I think it's possible, I think it's probable, that the whole course of life is disturbed by this unwillingness to place God in his proper position where he belongs. And I believe life continues off course until a person relinquishes control of their life and stops seeking honor for themselves and instead recognizes Jesus Christ on the throne of their life and honors him as the one who is in control over all things. Amen, amen, and amen. If you're not awake, I'll say it for you. <laughs> now look at the other side of this. What is God's response to a person who chooses to do this? Well, I've talked to you about this already. Uh, God exalts the person who is willing to make this choice. Not only is this person's desire fixed upon God, but God's desire, listen to me please, God's desire is now fixed upon that person. Get that, get that. When you focus your desire upon Him, he puts his desire upon you. He manifests his grace to you. He puts his honor upon you. 
Not only is that person's desire fixed upon God, God's desire is fixed upon that person, and the one who does this is more precious to God than all the treasure that may be found in all the earth. God blesses that person. God values that person. God uses that, the person as his, that person as his display. He manifests his grace and his goodness and his exceeding kindness toward that person because they've exalted the Son, Jesus Christ, and he can walk with them and he can have fellowship with them without restraint. With, him, with them, with that person who puts God in his proper place, God can act like the God he is. <laughs> Not to veil himself or pull himself back because of the sin that exists. When a person places that Jesus places Jesus Christ upon the throne of their life, recognizes him there, God can act like the God he is with that person. Folks, hear me. The only avenue you have to pursuing God is what we're talking about this morning. The only avenue you have to attain him fully in relationship with him, the only way to have full relationship with the Father is by recognizing Jesus Christ upon the throne of your life. And until I'm willing to make that choice, unless I'm willing to exalt him to his rightful place, I will never pursue him fully. He will never be to me all that he wants to be to me. It won't happen. Now, one more thing about this and we'll close. Unless I'm willing to exalt him to his rightful place, he'll never pursue me. And I must recognize God as complete Lord, as complete Lord of my life. And that is not a choice that is made just with my mind. That is not a conscious, rational choice that I make, not only. It is also a choice that must be made with the heart. In other words, it's not a choice made just on the rational level. I don't make this choice the way I decide what I'm going to wear to wear, what I'm going to wear for the day, or what I'm going to have for breakfast, or whatever other choice I might make. It's not that kind of a choice at all. This choice is not made just with the mind. It is also made with the heart. My mind must be involved, and my heart must be involved as well. Because you see, folks, I hope you understand from what we talked about here this morning. It's not an easy choice to make. You're setting a lot of things aside to exalt Jesus Christ to the throne that he belongs on. You're setting a lot of goals and ambitions and desires and wants aside when you place Jesus Christ upon the throne and recognize him there as his rightful place. Making that choice is going to change your approach to everything else. Everything changes when Jesus Christ is recognized on the throne of your life. And unless my heart is in agreement, unless my will is completely submitted to this decision, I will never endure what this decision will call upon me to endure. And the result is there's going to be division inside me. I'll have him on the throne, but I'll keep looking the other direction for what else might be coming down the road. I'll have him on the throne, but I'll still want to get what I want. My desires will still be important to me. I'll have him on the throne, but if something else comes along, it may distract me and pull my vision off him and put something else on that throne instead of Jesus Christ. I've got to have a wholehearted, fully-minded decision in order for this to work the way God has for it to work. Unless my heart is in agreement, unless my will is completely submitted to the decision that I'm making, I will never endure what this decision will call upon me to endure. You see, folks, part of me will be seeking to recognize him as Lord, and part of me will be resisting that choice every step of the way. And in the end, that division will prevent me from knowing the joy and the satisfaction that comes with exalting Jesus Christ to his proper place. James talked about this in James 1.8. James talked about double-minded people. Do you remember that? And what did he say about double-minded people? He said they were unstable. Unstable. What that means is a double-minded person can get knocked around and knocked away and be knocked off course. We talked about that on Thursday night. You see, folks, when I'm double-minded, I'm unstable. And if I'm unstable, I will not continue to keep him on the throne. I'll put something else on the throne and not recognize him where he needs to be. And you see, folks, that's going to create a problem in my life beyond what I have right now. What I get in result of that is confusion and instability. I get no joy. I get no peace. Believer, listen to me. God does not want you divided. God wants you wholehearted and whole-minded. God wants you fully committed, fully committed to exalting Him with all you have and with all you are. And by the way, God will not rest till He has all of you. God will not rest until He has all of you. God will pursue you and pursue you and pursue you. As you pursue Him, He is just in the same way pursuing you as well. And that pursuit will not end until we are convinced, heart, mind, and soul, that He has the right to be Lord, and He and He only deserves to sit upon the throne of my life. God is not satisfied with having part of you. God is not satisfied until He has all of you. God is not going to take part of you and leave the rest to somebody else or to yourself. God has staked his claim. The day he saved you, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, he possessed you, he bought you, he owned you. 
And God will not be satisfied until He has the entire possession, until He has all of you. What do I need to do? If I want to make this pursuit the goal of my life, if I want to have a relationship with God and be in harmony with Him, what do I need to do? I need to consider every detail of this decision that God is calling upon me to make. And I need to fall at His feet in worshipful prayer and commit everything that I have to Him. And I take off anything on that throne that is not Jesus Christ, anything that I have allowed to creep up there and displace this one who truly belongs there, I remove those things, I wipe them away and place Jesus Christ back on the throne where He belongs. I need to exalt Him and honor Him and surrender everything I have to Him. And if you will do that, and if I will do that, listen to me please, if you will do that, God will unveil Himself to you. You will see God in the way like you've never seen Him before. You will experience God in the way that you have never experienced Him before. Any person who is willing to do that will find God in unveiling Himself to you, and you will see His glory like you've never seen it before. Remember Moses back in the Exodus? Lord, show me your glory. Believer, God will answer that prayer for you. God will show you His glory. God will unveil Himself to you. God will place before you everything that He has, everything that He desires for you, will be placed before you, and you will have access to it all. The relationship becomes exactly what God wants it to be. It is right relationship, just like you wanted back in the garden. You'll have that if you choose to make Him, recognize Him rather, as Lord of your life. And the reason God will do that for you if you make this choice and place Him on the throne and recognize Him there, the reason He will do all of that for you is because God can trust that one who exalts Him. God can trust His glory with you. God can trust His honor with you. God knows His honor is safe in the hands of that one who has fully consecrated Himself to Jesus Christ. And when you do that, the pursuit is realized. When you do that, the pursuit is settled. You'll know Him. You'll be in relationship with Him. You'll be in harmony with Him. God will fulfill that law of 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30 in your life. God honors that one. God honors that one who will honor Him. Father, thank You for Your Word this morning. Father, help us to make the choice to honor You in all that we do. Father, help us recognize You as Lord of our lives. Father, You already are Lord. You've already staked that claim. Father, may we bring ourselves into alignment with You by recognizing You as Lord. In every decision, in every thought, in every word, in every action, dear Father, may you be recognized in our lives as Lord. And Father, we wait today and look forward to the day that we do that and the honor that you provide back to us because of that. As we exalt you, Father, you will honor us. And Father, we will be in right relationship with you. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of knowing your Son, Jesus Christ, and our salvation. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.